the AMD Ryzen 5 4500 for their Socket AM4 platform is the cheapest 6-core CPU you can buy today. Wait, seriously? Okay, so it's the cheapest 6-core 12-thread CPU you can buy today. At under £65, it undercuts the current go-to gaming staple, the quad-core i3-12100F with 50% more threads. Which sounds amazing, but it's cheap for a reason, right? If Nvidia is guilty of bamboozling customers with misleading GPU model numbers, AMD has been leading the charge on the CPU front. The Ryzen naming structure is an unintuitive mess, so before we talk about the 4500 itself, I need to clear some things up. The Ryzen 3000 series is based on Zen 2 architecture, mostly, but we won't go into details right now, I'm already risking information overload here. The Ryzen 5000 series is Zen 3. Zen 3 is better than Zen 2 in terms of performance and efficiency. It would make sense then if the 4000 series would be somewhere between the two. Right? Wrong. The 4000 series is actually worse than the Zen 2 based 3000 series in several key ways. Comparing the 4500 and the 3600, both are Zen 2s with 6 cores and 12 threads and 65 watt TDPs, but the 4500 has only one quarter of the level 3 cache. L3 cache is one of the single biggest determining factors in gaming performance when comparing otherwise similar CPUs. It's the reason some folks lose their mind over AMD's X3D chips and their literal stack of cash, and it's only one of the corners that have been cut. Another pretty big deal is the lack of support for Gen 4 PCI Express. As this chip will only run graphics cards at Gen 3 speeds, that means some modern budget graphics cards like the RX 6400 and RTX 4060 will have their performance held back too. Finally, the 4500 is clocked slightly lower than the Ryzen 3600, but that's pretty much a formality as both chips have unlocked multipliers. Despite these apparent downsides, there is one silver lining. The 4500 is essentially a 4600G APU without the integrated graphics. Ryzen APUs always have lower cache and less PCIe bandwidth than their equivalent CPUs. This is part of the trade-off of dedicating a lot of space on the die for a comparatively powerful iGPU, but a fringe benefit is that APUs tend to have better memory controllers. For that reason, I'm pairing this chip with some DDR4 4000 RAM, which I would normally have to downclock to 3866 or 3600 if I were reviewing any other AM4 CPU. Not this time. As I'm pushing the boat out on the memory front, I've also gone a touch overkill everywhere else. The motherboard is a Gigabyte B550, and I'm using a Vitru V5 tower cooler, which I'd hoped would help with overclocking. Alas, I had no luck at all. PBO resulted in clocks only about 50 MHz above stock, and while manually overclocking to 4.3 GHz kinda worked, it was pretty unstable, so I ended up leaving the multiplier at 42, which is uh, pretty much no overclock at all. The GPU is a Radeon RX 6900 XT to remove that as a possible bottleneck. Given how cheap high refresh monitors have become lately, it's not unrealistic for someone shopping in the budget section to target a high FPS in games like Valorant. These DX11 games don't really take advantage of multiple cores and instead thrive on clock speeds and L3 cache, two areas where the 4500 isn't exactly well endowed. Still, while it's not competing with the more modern chips I've tested recently, it is almost good enough for a rock-solid 144Hz, with an average frame rate of over 240 and 1% lows of 142. If you wanted to go the extra mile, however, the i3-12100F is a whopping 25% faster on average. Music 
Fortnite in performance mode is running in DX11. However, it does seem to still be using all the available threads to some degree. However, the actual results for the 4500 are shocking. Some of this may be Fortnite's fault. I've heard people talking about a performance drop on their own systems, which I haven't verified personally as I tend to move on from a given CPU once I've finished testing it. But given how appalling 1% lows have been lately, I'm inclined to believe them. The average FPS is 210, which is okay, but far lower than even some of the dirt cheap Xeons I've tested. The 1% lows are Soissant Nerf, which in this context is not nice at all. Rounding out the DX11 tests is Counter-Strike 2, and while the numbers aren't quite as big as Valorant, the 4500 is capable of a pretty smooth experience. At 1440 low, the GPU is not being bothered at all, and the average frame rate passes 160 and 1% lows approach 100. In a vacuum, these stats are pretty healthy, but in the context of the other CPUs I've tested, it's not quite so impressive. For example, the Xeon E5 1650V3 doesn't need to be overclocked to match or beat these numbers, and you can buy it and an AliExpress motherboard for about the same price as the 4500 on its own. I'm not saying you should do that, but um, I think about these things. into the world of DX12 games, and Warzone shows some surprising results. The 6-core budget Ryzen actually beats some stiff competition here, with a 133 FPS average that's not only quite smooth for this title, but competitive with some Zen 3 CPUs too. Of course, this is a live service game and one that's pretty tough to keep consistent results over time with, but that doesn't take anything away from the fact that this is a pretty stellar result. Things aren't quite so smooth in Starfield's New Atlantis. This game is generally demanding, but the big cities are particularly rough on CPUs, and this is no exception. Although the Ryzen 4500 is decidedly close to the i3-12100F, it's also not able to hit a 60fps average, and while that's less crucial in a single-player title, it's still disappointing. On the bright side, you have access to frame generation now. If that's your thing. I have two tests for Cyberpunk 2077. One is at the medium preset, which I think is the more appropriate one for the 4500, as I'm thinking most people in the market for a £60 CPU are probably going to pair it with something like an RX 6600 or RTX 3060, and medium settings would be a pretty safe bet. The 4500 can handle the lower crowd density and no ray tracing quite nicely, with an average of almost 90 FPS that's only about 10% below the i3. Turning on the RT Ultra mode narrows the gap with the quad-core Intel even more, but not in a good way. Neither chip can hit the 60 mark and only manage to average around 50 FPS. The natural perfect frame rate, of course. The Last of Us evidently needs a lot of CPU horsepower to render all these uh, leaves and stuff, so it loads up all the cores and threads pretty heavily. On a weaker CPU, this could be a problem. However, in this case, the 4500 acquits itself nicely, averaging close to 80 FPS with lows of 51. This is only a couple frames short of the i3. However, it is still about 40% below what the Ryzen 5 5600X is capable of. It may be the case that Dragon's Dogma 2 only stays in my test suite as a kind of litmus test. If you saw my i3-12100F video, you'll know it failed, producing an unholy mess of an experience just from wandering around the city. The Ryzen 5 4500 is infinitely better than the i3 in this regard, producing a 48fps average with almost cinematic 1% lows. I don't think it's worth talking about DD2 in terms of playable, like we don't compare different bleachers for their drinkability, but in terms of pure numbers, 
yes, the Ryzen wins this one. I'd normally cover Microsoft Flight Sim here, but for some reason it just quit out every time I tried to start, and rather than spend time trying to fix it, I decided to return to Jedi Survivor. I removed this title from my rotation for similar reasons to why I'm skeptical about Dragon's Dogma. Regardless of the numbers I see in the benchmark, I'm yet to be convinced that any reasonably priced CPU can make the game playable, and yet I do have a ton of data to compare the Ryzen to. Plus, I have a gap in my video if I don't. The 4500 can hit a 76 FPS average at high settings, which is better than the stock 6 core Haswell Xeon, but between 50 and 100% short of the higher end Ryzen's. I'll have benchmark results from the 12100F added in next week's review of the i5 12400F, so keep an eye out for that one. Ending my gaming tests, Civ 6 completes the AI turn time benchmark with an average of 6.6 .6 seconds. When testing DaVinci Resolve, I used the free edition to render a 5 minute 4K H.264 clip using the highest quality settings, which can create some unrealistically long render times. In reality, using a CPU to render video doesn't need to be this slow, and using a GPU could be faster still, but I've got a database of results from testing this way, and it would be a shame to have to start from scratch. Anyway, the render completed in 17 and a half minutes more than 8 minutes faster than the i3, and less than a minute and a half slower than the 5600X. The Blender Classroom render completed in a little over 9 minutes, once more beating the i3 by a healthy margin, and within a minute of the 5600X. I'm beginning to think that this might be a low-key productivity beast for those on a budget. Of course, with all that being said, it's all well and good me testing this chip with fancy pants 4000 RAM, but what if you only have enough for 3200 RAM? Well, I didn't want to run the whole test suite a second time, I've been pretty busy lately, but I didn't want to leave you hanging. With clocks dropped from 4000 to 3200 and timings tightened to match a typical kit, the synthetic benchmarks see a small dip, Time Spy loses 2% from its overall score, whereas Fire Strike loses almost 3%, CS2 loses 10 frames, which is about 7%, and Starfield loses 4 frames, which is also about 7%. The biggest impact is in Jedi Survivor, this one falls from 76 FPS to 64, which is more than a 15% drop. On the one hand, this is a clear instance where spending a little extra can give a healthy performance boost. However, as a percentage of the total system cost, that might not be the most economical use of your budget, and with future upgrades in mind, none of the desirable Zen 3 chips can actually utilise DDR4-4000 at a 1 to 1 infinity fabric ratio, so even if you buy DDR4000, you're probably going to have to downclock it to 3866 or 3600 anyway. Maybe some low latency 3600 would be a better match, though as DDR5 takes over I think that might be a bit hard to find for a reasonable price. Anyway, I feel like I'm splitting hairs over a budget CPU here. I am genuinely surprised by the Ryzen 5 4500. Based purely on specs, I was prepared to be very cynical about it. As someone inclined to recommend buying used wherever possible, the Ryzen 5 3600 seems like a no-brainer alternative. However, Ryzen AM4 chips are a little more fragile than Intel's and the newer AM5 Ryzen's, so if you're in the market for a cheap starter CPU for gaming and productivity, and don't feel like taking a risk on the second-hand market, this is actually a lot more capable than I expected. 
It's not flawless, of course. There are a few problematic titles, and the i3-12100F is still objectively the better chip for gaming overall, if not for productivity. However, nothing is 100% unplayable on the 4500, and the versatility of the AM4 socket is such that you don't need to switch platforms to get a hell of an upgrade in the future. So, I don't necessarily think the choice between this and the much newer architecture of the i3 is quite so clear cut after all. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.